Hello, my name is Dinesh Chetri. I'm a otolaryngologist. And my name is Andrew Ehrman. I am a speech pathologist. Today we're going to discuss a, a technique for evaluation of uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia called flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, also known as FEES. And we're going to contrast that with the technique of modified barium swallow evaluation because these are the two most common techniques that we use for evaluation of oropharyngeal dysphagia. So what is FEES? Uh, FEES is, as uh, Dr. Chatri said, a flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. A uh, flexible transnasal endoscope um, is inserted through the nasal passage and into the pharynx so that we can observe uh, swallowing. Um, the procedure should be performed with a camera, monitor, and recording system so that for easy visualization and so that you can review. And uh, we want to establish if there is abnormality and if there is, uh, are there any interventions that we can do at the time from a behavioral point of view that could help improve the uh, swallow function of the patient. So the procedure is done by a clinician, either a otolaryngologist or a speech language pathologist. And the person doing this technique should be aware of some of the more, more common causes of oropharyngeal dysphagia. So these can include neuromuscular disorders after stroke or Parkinson's disease, for example. It can be obstructions of the swallow mechanism, uh, including upper esophageal uh, sphincter dysfunction, Zenker's diverticulum. Uh, patients who have had radiation therapy also suffer from significant dysphagia as do patients with uh, laryngeal valve problems such as vocal fold paralysis and other forms of uh, laryngeal dysfunction. What are we trying to learn from an instrumental swallow evaluation, in this case FEES? Uh, number one, does the patient have an abnormal swallow? If so, we need to describe it in regard to aspiration. Is it occurring? And we need to consider swallow efficiency, the largest question of which is the patient uh, able to sustain themselves uh, from a nutritional and hydrational point of view. Uh, we would like to be able to recommend the safest diet for the patient. And if there is an abnormality, uh, we need to consider what the treatment plan should be, whether it is behavioral or surgical. Now we're going to demonstrate the procedure. Before we scope, let's go over some swallowing basics. Swallow has several phases, oral preparatory, oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal. The main focus for fees is on bolus clearance through the pharyngeal phase and lower airway protection. So we'll be looking for residue in the vollecula, posterior pharyngeal wall, piriform sinus, and we'll also be looking for penetration and aspiration. First thing to do is to prepare the patient. The patient is seated comfortably on a chair or, or seated in a gurney. First thing I would do is to anesthetize the nasal cavity with just a small amount of anesthetic, typically a combination of 4% lidocaine and 4% neosinephrine. Uh, I've already prepared the patient's nasal cavity at this point. The next thing is to look at the food we're going to give to the patient, and we're going to instill a small amount of food dye into this uh, liquid and the pureed food that we have here so that we can visualize as the food passes through the pharynx. For uh, solid food consistency, we typically use cookies. So after the uh, food is adequately prepared, we are ready to perform the endoscopy and have the patient swallow some food uh, boluses. So always want to make sure that the patient is comfortable. I typically look at both nasal cavities to see which one is more open for the endoscope. And in this case, we've chosen the left side. I'm inserting the scope through the floor of the nose towards the nasopharynx, and then pass into the junction of the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. Here, I'm going to stop at the level of the palate, so I can see the entire swallowing apparatus. I'm able to visualize the vollecula and the larynx. Generally speaking, if you want to evaluate the function of the larynx, 
uh, you want to uh, go ahead and pa have the patient phonate. Uh, could you go ahead and say e? E. Okay. So the larynx, uh, the vocal folds are working properly. The larynx uh, function is normal. There is no pooling of secretions. So now we're ready to test the patient with different food boluses. We typically start with the food bolus that is the safest and easiest for the patient. So now we're going to start with the pureed food consistency. So while Andy's feeding the patient, I'm looking at what the food bolus is doing as it goes down. You can see, let's give him one more. We want to test the same bolus at least twice to check for repeatability. During the swallow, there is a whiteout where you cannot see what is happening. After the swallow, you can observe for residue in the vollecula, posterior pharyngeal wall, and the piriform sinus. After observing for residue, you will insert the endoscope further towards the endolarynx, looking for penetration and aspiration. Go ahead and say E. E. Okay. So now after the pureed food bolus, we will test the patient for liquid. We can start with a small amount of liquid with a teaspoon if you suspect that the patient may have difficulty swallowing. So let's go and start with a teaspoon. Great, you can see a small amount of residue in the pharynx, otherwise there is no penetration or aspiration. And then you can go ahead and subsequently try with a uh, sip of the cup or with a straw. I'm going to try the next bolus with a uh, straw. Great, go ahead and say E. E. Okay. And breathe. Okay, so the next bolus we'll try will be a cookie. We will give the patient a small cookie to bite. And while the patient is chewing, you can get a sense of what's happening in the oral cavity by how long it takes for the bolus to be swallowed. And if there's any abnormalities like premature spillage or penetration or aspiration before the swallow. Now, He's already swallowed, and at this point, I'm looking again for residue. There is minimal residue in the vollecula, and again, looking for penetration and aspiration. Go ahead and say E. E. So after the swallowing is done, if there are any abnormalities, we can also do compensatory maneuvers to see if the swallowing can be improved with those maneuvers. So after the swallow study is done, you want to remove the scope atraumatically. And now we're going to review the recording. Okay, so let's analyze Johnny's swallow. So overall, it looked like a fairly normal swallow to me. He had a little bit of residue in the vollecula, and so probably signifies a little bit of uh, swallowing weakness. He looks like he's got a great swallow. Yeah, there was no penetration, no aspiration, so essentially a normal swallow. So let's go over some abnormal fees findings. Here in the figure, you can see vollecular residue. This is typically due to pharyngeal weakness, epiglottic dysfunction, or oral cavity residue that falls into the vollecula. This figure shows piriform sinus residue. Piriform sinus residue without vollecular residue suggests upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. It can also be due to inferior pharyngeal constrictor weakness or from spillage from vollecular residue or oral cavity. This figure shows combined significant piriform sinus and vollecular residue. This signifies a more severe pharyngeal weakness, such as severe cervical esophageal stenosis, severe epiglottic dysfunction, or reduced high laryngeal elevation. Let's discuss the findings of penetration and aspiration. Penetration occurs when food or liquid enters the laryngeal vestibule. Aspiration occurs when food or liquid passes below the vocal folds into the trachea. Penetration or aspiration can occur before, during, or after the pharyngeal swallow, and it is important to understand why the patient penetrated or aspirated. If penetration or aspiration occurs, it is important to note if the patient has a laryngeal cough reflex. Absent cough reflex signifies laryngeal sensory deficit. 
and it is also important to know if the patient is sensate to the pharyngeal residue. Now that we've demonstrated the FEES procedure, let's discuss how does FEES compare to MBSS. With FEES, since you're using an endoscope, no radiation is needed, and you can spend a lot more time performing the procedure. With a modified barium swallow study, the patient is being radiated, so we want to keep the procedure short. Occasionally, there is a little discomfort because it is an invasive procedure and with a small risk of epistaxis. A modified barium swallow study is comfortable because the patient is just sitting in a chair and there is no bleeding. Fees can be done in almost any environment, at the bedside, in the clinic, in an inpatient hospital bed. Modified barium swallow studies are almost always done in a radiology suite and the patient has to be able to sit upright in a chair, typically. With fees, you're getting a superior to inferior view of the swallowing apparatus. And with a modified barium swallow study, in contrast, you're getting a lateral view or an anterior posterior view, and you can also do an oblique view. With fees, you get excellent assessment of the swallowing anatomy. With a modified barium swallow study, unfortunately, you only see shades of gray, so you can make out structures, but not as, dis as distinctly as can occur with endoscopy. With fees, during the swallow, there is a whiteout period, and you are unable to see what's happening to the swallowing apparatus during the swallow. But with the modified barium swallow study, in contrast, you can see what's happening uh, during the pharyngeal phase of swallowing. You also can see what's happening in the oral cavity, which you cannot see in fees. You can also see the upper esophageal uh, sphincter and the trachea. So what is the best practice for assessment of oropharyngeal dysphagia? We perform both fees and MBSs frequently. And we find that these two tests are complementary in understanding the cause of the patient's swallowing dysfunction. By having both a FEES and a modified barium swallow study on the same patient, it gives us a much greater depth of understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the patient so that we can piece together what we think is really happening with the patient. Most importantly, what we have found is that a close working relationship between an otolaryngologist and a speech-language pathologist allows for more optimal management of the dysphagia patient. Uh, working with swallowing patients is highly rewarding, and uh, both Dr. Chetri and I would like to wish you the very best in your journey in taking care of this population.